We're going to talk about words. I realize also that I usually talk about dictionaries and how they're written and their history, but I've never given a talk that is only about words. Um, so this is an experiment for me, um, and I hope that it works. You may find that I'm speaking quickly because there's a lot of words in this presentation. Um, and basically what I what I wanted to talk about is something that seems obvious to me, it, it probably seems obvious to you, which is that French seems fancy to English speakers. There's something very particular about the French language. Um, and I always took that for granted. And I started asking myself why. Um, in the last hundred years, we could say that has a lot to do with culture. Um, with food, with clothing, um, with music. But I think it goes a little deeper than that. I mean, French seems fancy in the sense that we borrow words um, that are synonyms of English words, but that have other connotations. So we have words like in English, cooking and clothing and cake, but in French, we have cuisine and couture, right? And gâteau. And we have this kind of elevation of tone with these words. But I do think ultimately these are kind of superficial examples of the way that the English language acquires vocabulary. There's something odd about the way English borrows French words. And I started thinking about the way English borrows words from other languages. Why don't we have the same relationship to the Polish borrowings? I'm ethnically sort of half. Um, Yep, that's okay. <laughs> I'm ethnically sort of half and half. Um, and even in my own family, I know sort of the Polish words as well as the French words. And um, the Polish ones, I, I, I mostly think of as food words, unsurprisingly. Um, but they all, again, they don't have the same kind of, um, uh, yeah, je ne sais quoi. <laughs> so the recent borrowings in French, recent in, in, in linguistics terms, recent really means the last hundred years. And notice that we kind of keep the spellings, right? These are English terms, but we keep the French spellings, we kind of keep their pronunciations more recently. As you go back in time, that changes and we'll see that. But we'll think about other modern borrowings from other languages. These are other words that don't as a group collectively have the same kind of cultural resonance that the French words do. We say that we borrow words in English. That's what, lexic that's what uh, linguists say, we borrow words. But the thing about that term is that we never give them back. They become um, part of the language. There have been several waves of words from French and Latin over the centuries. And you're gonna to start to see that I'm sort of going to blend French and Latin together for reasons that I'll explain, but re that are probably obvious to you. With, with French, there's something quite particular because what we found is that the, the uh, with older French borrowings, the Frenchier, the fancier, the Frenchier, the word is, the fancier it is. In other words, these are words that were borrowed uh, first, gentle and artist and macaroon. But then a few hundred years later, in each of these cases, we had the same exact French word come to English a second time. Every time it comes back, first of all, it's more French in its spelling. Second of all, it's usually more narrow and specific in its meaning. So from gentle to genteel, from artist to artiste, from the lumpy coconut macaron to the you know lighter than air a macaroon to the lighter than air macaron. By the way, I just realized macaron is a definition I actually wrote in the dictionary. If you look that, look it up. The, the the sandwich one, not the other one. You might know notice that I don't like coconut. Um, a word like platoon, meaning a group of men who are soldiers, came into the uh, English language in the 17th century. But peloton, meaning a group of riders, which is actually the same exact French word. But you can see what happens when a word comes. Um, into English, we anglicized it, right? Pelton became platoon. And then later, more recently in the 1930s and 40s, when the Tour de France coverage was you know, uh, coming over, um, we kept the spelling, peloton. Um, spying and espionage, it's interesting, that is the same word, but you see spy almost has a Germanic kind of sound to it because it was borrowed so long ago that it has been nativized, it has been anglicized. Um, words like chief and chef, obviously that narrowing of meaning, chef is so specific, chief is so general, they're the same word in French. Perfect and parfait is another good one. Um, so what is so special about French? Well, first of all, the big elephant in the room, we all, we all know 
We all know what happened, but there are really two stories here and, and both of them kind of split into two. So there's, there's gonna be four waves that we'll talk about, a consequential coincidence and the great Norman conquest. I'm, I don't have time to give a, uh, a precy of the Norman conquest, of course, but I understand that I think we all get the joke. Um, one thing I, I think it's important to mention though, and I, you know, especially in, 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 in groups um, in, in North America, uh, where the reputation, the military reputation of France in the 20th century is often a negative one. People don't realize the extent to which this victory was really a Norman victory, that the, the Normans came and imposed their system of government and nobility and everything else and, and, and legal system. The consequential coincidence is that when the Normans came over in 1066, the language that they spoke was essentially bad Latin. Um, now that's a manner of speaking. No linguist should complain about what I'm saying, but it was a direct descendant of the of the of the Latin on the continent, and it had become, as other language groups had become, directly from Latin. We had Italian and Portuguese and Spanish and other other um, varieties made. So we do uh, we all kind of know what what happened there. Um, but this is why English is so rich in synonyms. There is no language in the world that has the number of synonyms, the kind of synonymy that English has. I mean, just a basic ones like smell and odor and old and ancient. The words on the left are words of old English origin. And the words on the right are words of French origin. You'll see today that all the blue words are words of French or Latin origin. Um, Words like, but again, just think about it. We have deep and profound. We have kingly and royal. We have brotherhood and fraternity. I mean, there are literally tens of thousands of these in the English language. I just threw a few up here just to think about. And it shows you a little bit of the range of these words. Um, and I, I would say that the, uh, just as a small matter, matter of uh, pre precision, um, Old English, when I say Old English, that's a specific language. Um, I'd say I, I was talking to someone recently who, who I, re re I realized didn't, didn't realize that it's not just English that's old. Um, it's a very specific language. It is the language spoken, the Germanic language spoken in the British Isles before the Norman Conquest. Okay, the Germanic language spoken in the British Isles before the Norman Conquest. That is what old, so old English is a specific language. So these are on the left words that derive from old English and on the right words that derive from French or Latin. Now old, oh, here we go. <laughs> I, I, I sometimes put slides to remind myself to say things. This is one of them. But the thing is, while th these synonyms are numerous, they're only superficial examples still of the French and Latin vocabulary in English. Every one of the words with a, an asterisk in that sentence is from French. I think these are, again, another set of synonyms, shallow and superficial. There's so many, English has a second word for everything, it seems. What about just the, the imposition of government, bureaucratic and administrative words that happened as a consequence of the Norman conquest? The, the fact that the Normans were in charge meant that it was their language that people used. So we have every word like the word government, the word president, the word Congress, the word um, you know, counselor or treason, assembly, parliament, royal. That, I mean, these are just, again, a handful of these. Notice they're all French. Of course they're French because the victors of that war imposed their system of government. But it's interesting to note that these are the words that we use for our system of government. Of course, the church uh, was a big part of uh, European life around the 11th century. And these are words, that, of course, the Catholic church was essentially conducted, um, the mass was conducted in Latin. Um, so what you got were, were a bunch of words that were either Latin or French in origin. And again, all of them familiar with the word religion itself, you know, the word salvation itself. Any word that ends in T-I-O-N or S-I-O-N is a word that comes from French. Um, but words like cloister and convent and abbey, I mean, we, we take it for granted how, how much uh, French contributed. But of course, the, 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 the Normans also uh, imposed their system of laws. And so that is why our legal system, including the words judge and jury, and words like indict and arraign, um, words like criminal and convict and acquit and attorney, and I mean, it gets, it gets very basic, but it also goes very deep. As you all know, legal language is, is, is a very specific uh, and uh, uh, you know, professional language that people study for a long, long time. And in fact, there's even something called legalese, right? And uh, it says the specialized language of the legal profession. And notice, I love our little example sentence that said, replaced legalese with plain talk. And this is an opposition that we're gonna talk a lot about tonight. Replaced legalese with plain talk. Replaced the Latin terms with plain talk. And what is plain talk? It's interesting that the word plain, of course, is, a, is another French word, but, um, 
but talk, most of these one syllable Germanic words are, are pretty easy to recognize. Now there's a big asterisk here. Um, this is a, a linguistic detail that um, I only learned recently. So I can't imagine that um, many people have, have brought it up in you know, casual conversation. Um, it's a strange fact that for many words, we cannot tell in English which, which language it came from. Uh, in other words, a word like abdomen or conjugal or fugitive, we actually don't know. We have the written record of the term in English, but we do not know whether the person who used that word used their knowledge of Latin or used their knowledge of French to bring the word into English. Um, this is true for the words that are coined by Shakespeare, for example. There's, there's a couple hundred. Um, most of them are, are, have classical roots. Um, and it's almost certain that Shakespeare probably would have known Latin maybe a little better than French. Uh, if you were a scholar, of course, in, in the Renaissance into the 18th century, um, you were essentially a, a fluent reader of Latin at the very least. It doesn't necessarily mean you, you were a fluent reader of French. So in many cases, Latin is really probably where these words came from. But but what is indisputable is that these words are also in French because French derived from Latin. So that you can see the problem here. We just don't, in the mists of time, we just don't have the evidence. The Oxford English Dictionary has a beautiful kind of formula, formulation for these etymologies. If you look a word up, a word like castle or decent or creator in the, in the Oxford English Dictionary, it says partly a borrowing from French, semicolon, partly a borrowing from Latin. And so that's the way, now the Merriam-Webster dictionaries usually just say from Anglo-French or Latin or from French or Latin, so, you know, some kind of formula. It's not quite as poetic. Um, and th these are just, I just put a bunch of, of these words up in alphabetical order, but there are, are thousands of them. Um, and it's just an odd circumstance that English uh, language scholars can't even tell where these words came from, but we know where they ultimately go back to. So let's go a little bit deeper. Again, another, another set of synonyms, deep and profound. Let's now look at the academic words. Of course, Latin was the language of instruction. We have a word like teacher that is uh, from the old English roots, but think of the French words, master, instructor, lecturer, doctor, professor, right? To say nothing of the words, you know, student itself, the word school, the word college, the word university, all of them are French words. You're starting to see a little bit in this deeper look, um, a, a distinct class difference. The people who were ecclesiastical, the people who were academics, the people who were bureaucrats would have command of French or Latin. So these are old English roots versus Latin roots. Again, we have an activity called reading, but the study is literature, right? We, hate, we know what thought is, but if you, if you study it, it is philosophy. Um, healing becomes medicine, weather becomes meteorology. This is you know, across the board with every single discipline, the word discipline itself, of course. They're all um, terms from Latin or French that are the, or, or, or Greek. And again, I, I, I skipped a little, a little piece, which is of course, um, the Greek terminology was essentially absorbed by Latin, Right, and then so most of those terms that we think of uh, as 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 Greek words, like the word philosophy, went from Greek to Latin to French to English. They went in that direction. There are a few that that had, um, for example, origins in Arabic, a word like algebra, but algebra was adopted by uh, Latin speakers, so the, that word came to English through Latin. Um, so as far as English speakers were concerned, it was a Latin word, but it was borrowed from. Yes, so the, the origin is always Greek to Latin to French to English. That's a, that's a very good point. <laughs> um, but also the words about words, this kind of meta language, right? Sentence, grammar, verb, noun, rhetoric, metaphor, simile, dialogue, and many, many, many others. Um, they're all French and Latin words. Indeed, or Greek, Greek of course. Um, and we do also have the basic terms like dictionary, diction meaning speaking. Um, but, you know, we have this, this system of English uh, synonymy in which um, we have rain, but we have precipitation. We have old, but we have superannuated, right? We, we have curse, but we have malediction. We have poor, but impecunious. You know, it's always the, the, the laughable, funny word that is a Latin or French term. And again, the T-I-O-N words are always uh, from French. Think and cogitate. Some of them just make you smile, um, and they're very consistently... Um, more distant 
from the meaning itself. The fact that we're laughing about those words puts a little bit of emotional distance, doesn't it? Um, and in fact, that abstraction is really something to think about because these are other synonyms. Some of them like umbrage are almost always figurative, right? We, we don't say, I mean, you could say he was in the shadow of his brother, for example, that's clearly a figurative usage. But to take umbrage, that word is almost never used to mean a literal shadow. You, you, you see how some of these words can flip. Um, wedding and nuptials, gap and chasm, alone and solitary is a really good one. Those are, those are we've created a little bit of a semantic distance between some of these. But my point is the abstraction becomes this sort of formal language. We have two registers. We have an old English register and a Latin or French one. Now, this is further deepened by the fact that we have adjectives that come from one of these languages, but concrete nouns that come from the other. If it's something that you hold in your hands or look up in the sky, it's an old English word like moon. Why is it moon but lunar, cat but feline? monkey but simian, tooth but dental. Notice in every case, the adjective is the Latin or French word, and the, uh, the noun, the concrete noun itself is the old English word. And the fact is, these are terms of abstraction, but they're terms of expertise, right? They determine who is treating you. Words like paternal as opposed to father, um, juvenile for the diseases. We don't say we usually don't say it's a child's disease. We usually have a, a term like, but a term like carnal or amorous, they end up being kind of euphemistic um, because they are terms of expertise and abstraction. This emotional distance is so important in the English language. If you meet a, a person and are having a conversation, you don't say, is your mother dead? You say, is she deceased? There's a, there's a politeness. So again, we're talking about register. The word obese for fat is just the same. Um, the police would report upon a victim or a criminal and say a female. They don't say a girl did it. They say it would be a female. If, if you're sick or drunk, you're indisposed, right? Um, but other terms, crazy, uh, morbid. A disease is morbid. It's not deadly. I mean, the fact is, sometimes you do hear um, deadly uh, you know, um, consequences or, or symptoms. But the fact is, morbid is the medical term. But think of what euphemisms are, right? We say senior citizen. We say capital punishment. Uh, we don't say killing a citizen, right? Um, we say um, uh, incontinence and collateral damage, bowel movement, corporal punishment, um, unintended consequences, but even vertically challenged, you know, is it, it, these are euphemisms. And notice every single word, both parts, they're all French and Latin. I mean, these are things we just never want to say out loud, and Latin lets us do it. And why is that? I mean, oh, this is a, just a scholar. I just happened to see this last week on Twitter. Never trust a man that refers to women as females. And again, this idea of disdain that comes from the emotional distance is created by the use of this kind of vocabulary. We all understand, as if you're a native speaker of English, I think most of us are, but if you're a very, very fluent speaker of English, everyone understands there is a register shift. You are in a different gear when you use these words. But of course, they're also the official terms of legal and medical professions. So the crime is murder, but the accusation is homicide, right? The crime is theft, but it's larceny. Why is it? And then for, for in, 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 in medical situations, you have drunk and medication, shot and injection, bruise and contusion. And again, there are thousands of these, and you encounter them every time you, uh, you go you know, for a checkup. But think of basic ones like ask and interrogate. You know, we have different words. You have ask, a clearly Germanic word, that monosyllabic, you know, very rooted word. Um, it's an emotional term. It's the one we use at home. But then there's question, right? Ask is Old English. Question is French. Interrogate is Latin. And in other words, you, you just move up the scale of register. This is why in English we have this uh, unusual idiomatic use of doublets. And you've, I bet you've probably never even thought of this, but back in the Middle Ages, because in the legal profession, you were dealing with people who were either a little less familiar with Latin or a little less familiar with French than they were in their own language, which is why in the case of the English, Old English doublets, you have free and clear, law and order, fit and proper, will and testament. But, you know, a lot of these, they're both French and Latin because there were people who were more familiar to, with French than with Latin. So you have cease and desist, legal and valid, part and parcel expressed or implied terms and conditions, confirm or deny. I mean, we don't even think about these because we, they are what linguists call chunks. We just think of them as a single meaning. And it is somewhat odd. Um, there's another one called uh, emoluments and salaries, which might, which might ring the bell of some people. And if you look in 18th century legal writing, 
in England and in America, and indeed in the Constitution of the United States, that is something that's linked. Um, but you might be saying, weren't the Romans in Britain? Where was the Latin of the Romans? And the simple fact is, there ain't any. Uh, they didn't leave behind much. They left in the uh, fourth century. They went to Gaul to fight another war, and this was during the disintegration of the Roman Empire. It's important to mark also that the people who were subjugated by the Romans in Britain at, th at that time were not speakers of Old English. They were Celtic speakers. So in other words, even if the Romans had lent Latin words to those languages, those were not constituent languages of modern English the way we know it today. Certainly there's a lot of Celtic words in English, but none of the Latin in English came through Celtic. Um, so what, I mean, just as a little kind of brief aside here, you do, you had the Angles, the Saxons and the Jutes. And a lot of people have heard of these tribes from what is today Denmark. Um, and they just sailed over within a few decades of the Romans leaving. And they brought with them the language that they spoke. Well, they spoke as they do today, a Germanic first cousin of English. The Germanic language that they spoke became Old English. But because we're now in the fourth and fifth centuries, this is now Christian Europe. So they brought over to Great Britain a Germanic language that had embedded in it Latin words because Christianity had already, um, you know, taken over the Roman Empire. So uh, first of all, these are among the oldest Latin words in the English language, and you recognize them all as being words of the church, including words like priest, and which is a cognate, of course, to fr in French, you know, with the S's, I have a whole, I could go a whole riff on the, on the circumflex, um, but where the circumflex is, is where an S had been, right? So the fact that we say priest in English, but prêtre in French um, has to do with the fact that, um, that in Old French, there was an S there. That's why forêt and forest and you know, there's many, many others. Um, that's a whole different lecture. You can come another time. Um, but these words, and the thing is, there are other words that, to be honest, surprise even me. These are words that are so anglicized because they were in English before the language was in England. Um, uh, they, they are anglicized to the point of almost seeming Germanic to me, certainly a word like street, which is just stratum, right? Stratus, stratum, um, and mile and cheese and chalk and pound. But these are, if you go back far enough, the thing about pound is, pound is a unit, is a unit of weight, right? And what, how do you weigh something? You hang it, it's pondre, right? It's, it's the same, uh, which is our English to ponder something is to weigh the ideas in your mind. And so that's a good example of a Latin word that becomes figurative, right? You're, it, it, the, the English word is way, the Latin word is ponder, and ponder is always figurative. And that's that's a good example of the way this works. But what about, now this is now we're splitting, um, we split uh, uh, the French a little bit, now we're splitting the Latin. There's something called New Latin, and just like Old English is a language, New Latin is a language. New Latin was the, the Latin used after the Roman Empire by, as the scholarly language of Europe, right, uh, by academics. The lingua franca, if you will, of science. And so in our unabridged dictionary, we actually have over 24,000 entries that say New Latin in the vocabulary. These are words that you all know very well. I just took a, a, a handful of from the letter A just to look at, um, and it is striking. Some of them are, are words like acetaminophen that clearly the Romans didn't have, um, but other words like abnormal or even algae, you'd, you'd think, well, maybe they, they might have had a word like that, but they're, cr they're created, they're artificial terms that were created from parts that were Greek or Latin parts and this is words like chrysanthemum and hydrangea, the name of every single plant and flower, the name, and of course the official name, the uh, technical genus and species of every animal. That's why a cat is, is phalus and a dog is canus, canus and a, a horse is equus, right? Now, this uh, new Latin um, comes from, by the way, now we're talking about a little bit later, 16th and 17th century. So now, first of all, we have the printing press. We have much, much more widespread literacy and a kind of scholarship that's being shared around Europe. And so what happened was the, the words that came into French after the Norman conquest, words like debt or faith or judge, were, um, were kind of corrected by the people who knew, oh, well, obviously debt, which came from French, and you know the word in French has no B, right? And so that's why we don't say the B in, in debt. But some smarter scholars said, well, I don't care if we don't say the B in English, we're gonna spell it that way anyway. 
Um, but that's why we have, oh, and above, I'm sorry, we can't see, governor, the word governor and gubernatorial. Do you ever notice? So there's all of these pairings like this. They are the same. They are from the same words, but, um, and here's a bunch more. Um, but what we did was borrow a French form initially and then borrow a Latin form as a second uh, word. So frail and fragile are the same word. Fierce and feral are the same word. Doubt and dubious, debt and debit governor gubernatorial so what you see is the the much more latinate form later which is the, the deemed the more correct one um and, and that's another interesting the, the idea the idea of correctness in english did not exist until the 18th century because there were no dictionaries right there was an idea of a correct latin because that was a classical dead language um and in english there were the, the first dictionary is 1604 right so shakespeare had no dictionary so here's a, 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 what I was talking about. The French words that came first, like doute became doubt, debt became debt, andite becomes indict. But in the, in the case of these English words, they're all corrected, in quotes, corrected, which is why they're silent Bs, silent Ss, and silent um, Ps. I mean, in, now the ones I put asterisks on, these are words that are no longer spelled this way in French. Um, obviously, there is now a circumflex that didn't exist of, uh, at that time. Plumber, um, that, uh, we say plon in French to mean lead course, but it's not spelled this way. And soutide, soutide, they, the, the French also put a, put a B back in there, which you barely hear in French. Um, so what happened was everybody sort of recognized that French was bad Latin and they tried to make it better. And the real consequence of this, of course, is the national spelling bee. Because we've just made a very difficult and non-phonetic system of recording sounds worse much, much worse. Because in the case of these words, we're taking a French pr pronunciation with a Latin spelling and calling it English. Um, and it's, this is why we have spelling bees in the United States, or at least in the, in the English language. I know it's not such a big deal in, in Britain, but this is, why, this is why there's no spelling bee in France. There's no, I mean, there is a grammar um, competition which involves spelling, of course, but spelling is not the difficult part because etymology is unquestioned in you know, Spanish and Italian and French. I mean, they're all from the same source. The problem with English, of course, you have all of these different groups that includes, of course. Um, and that's why, by the way, if you watch, I'm, I'm on the staff of the National Spelling Bee. If you watch the bee at the end, you will notice there are very few words of Greek and Latin roots at the end because they know those kids have studied so well. And that sometimes the questions are, the kid will say, does this come from the Latin word for elephant? And you realize, okay, the kid knows this backwards and they're gonna get it right. Um, and so uh, we now at the B have to find words of etymologies that are Hawaiian or Korean or Polish, or because if there's a C, you know, the C Z S kind of cluster or whatever, that's the only way. We're, because anything with classical roots is just simply too easy. Um, but why do classical etymologies have such authority? Because we're talking about all these words, and I'm, I'm sort of asserting that they form a almost like a, a, a class hierarchy in, embedded in our language, and I think they really do. One of the things that this authority, one of the things I've learned just by kind of doing this job in a kind of public way is the authority of oldness, the authority of ancientness, the authority that people uh, give to things like the Bible or the Constitution or the dictionary. Those are all three, by the way, documents that people like to hit other people with over the head, um, which I think is a bad use for all three. Um, but um, the thing about classical etymologies, as opposed to old English etymologies, is that they they're very attractive. They tell a little story. They make the abstract complete. Um, if you say small, it's just this. Um, but if you say a word like euphemism, for example, it, you know, if you break it down, you means pleasant or beautiful, and the fe the the phoneme fem means speech. So pandemic means pan all demos from democratic all of the people. Um, complicit means to be folded together, implicit folded in, explicit folded out, right? So the fact is it's very satisfying for us to be able to break words down. The word infant means without speech. I mean, that's a very, very satisfying etymology. Collaborate, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Co, co together, labor, to labor together. That's what collaborate means. So it, it, there's something about Latin and, and French etymologies that is incredibly attractive to speakers of English because it seems like you can go all the way back and that's what the word means, that you can point to this. Elucidate is a great one, right? Elucidate to bring light. I mean, of course, you know. 
Um, but why are some words borrowed twice? I mean, once again, we saw a few that were borrowed twice between French and Latin, but what about other words that were borrowed within French? The fact is the Normans lost Normandy just a, just a, a, a century or so after, so that the Kingdom of France got pushed up. And so the Normans who initially used England as a colony had to retreat there and live there, and that became, you know, sort of their home. And so what, what one of the consequences is the difference between the French spoken in Ile de France um, and the different and the and the French spoken by the Normans was big enough that it was noticeable when 200 years later new words came into the language. This is why, for example, the, the and the Normans were essentially old were Vikings, had been Vikings. They were the Northmen, right? The Normans. Um, and so uh, they did not have the sh sound, they had the k sound. So you have castle, which is Norman, but chateau, which is French. Car carriage and chariot, camp and champion, um, card and chart, catch and chase, pocket and pouch, cattle and chattel, canal and channel. There are many, many, many others. They're all identical etymologically. They've fallen into slightly different slots in the English language because they were borrowed a couple hundred years apart, but they're the same words. Um, and th another interesting thing about... Um, Norman French is it had a W. There is no W in French. If you looked at the, the the letter W in the Petit Robert or something, every single word is English or German. You know, they're just borrowing. But the fact is, the Normans had this Scandinavian origins. They had a W. So the words warranty and guarantee were just borrowed a couple hundred years apart. They're the same word, right? The words with the Ws are the Norman words. So you have reward and regard. You have wise and guise, while and guile, wallop and gallop, warden and guardian, servant and sergeant. And this is why we have Guillaume le Conquérant, right? William the Conqueror. So, um, and there are others like, for example, servant and, yeah, servant and sergeant is a good one. Uh, again, you might not notice that, but you can see kind of exactly how these two words just simply landed in different places. But semantically, they're not that different. There's sometimes the dog that doesn't bark. Uh, there's sometimes the, the question that isn't obviously answered. One of the things about this subject that as I've looked into it is that, Almost all of these words are, are synonyms with Old English words. English has so many synonyms. But what about the words that don't really have synonyms? It's just interesting to me that these French words um, are really, they're all very abstract. Um, they're usually, you know, kind of a word like integrity, for example, is another one. Um, morals and principles and manners and etiquette. We really don't have Old English words that refer to these things. And again, this is another way that we underscore the, the social class of uh, that's that sort of imparted by these terms. Now, let's go back to the old English words, because they represent something else. I'm not saying that one language is better than the other. I'm saying that there's a privilege associated with one group of words. Um, of course, old English words are all the function words, the, the hardest working verbs in English to be, to go, to do, to have, but also, of course, the pronouns, she, he, it, they, them, and all the words of hearth and home. So, you know, home and food and door. Notice again, they, they, these basic words tend to all have like one syllable. They're very Germanic words. Notable that none of these words were in those first dictionaries, none of them. The first dictionaries of English were only lists of words that were of Latin and French and Greek origins. They were the hard words and they were actually literally called hard word dictionaries, sometimes inkhorn dictionaries, inkhorn from the ink, uh, from, the, from the, the, the well that you would use to write with a pen. Um, and they, they read kind of like bilingual dictionaries of the Renaissance. But we also have, you know, the important words, earth, wind, and fire. I mean, this is, this couldn't be more Germanic than that, right? Water and rain. There's also all of these, uh, which are always and uniquely Germanic words, right? I think that's an important point too, because again, my point is there's an emotional directness to these words, words like girl and mother and father and son and swears. What happens when you stub your toe or burn your, burn your thumb on the stove? Um, poets know this. Send not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Every single word is an Old English word. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Every single word is an Old English word. Shakespeare knew it so well, he played with it, right? To be or not to be, that is the question. The only French word is the abstract word, right? It's action is English, thought is French. Um, wherefore art thou Romeo, which is, of course, a word, as, as many of you probably know, is almost always misun misunderstood. Um, I mean, misunderstood as an English word. Wherefore means why, right, in this case. Um, but the politicians know it, too. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. 
all, almost all one syllable words, right? How powerful is that? Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And there's an interesting thing that happens in that speech because the word country actually, you have contre, there is a, there, it is a French word actually, but it sounds like a vulgar English word. There's something about that word when you compare it to the word nation that sounds English. And in fact, in that speech, in Kennedy's inaugural speech, when he refers to other countries, he says, and now let all nations know. He refers to foreign countries as nations and home is, again, the emotional distance of Latin and what is home and hearth, it's the old English words. And it's just funny because country just sounds English, kind of like the word streets. So we shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds. I mean, Churchill knew this. Every single word is an old English word. Streets, as, I, as we said, is, is such an ancient word that it seems Germanic, but the only French word in that entire sentence is the word surrender. And it's, it's, well, it's very French, but it also underscores the, the sort of the difference between the emotion and the abstraction, the legal, you know, the, you know, the sort of, um, we will never do anything as official as this because our hearts are somewhere else. I just think it's a, just an amazing opposition um, philosophically. Now, George Orwell wrote a very famous essay, as you probably know, called Politics and the English Language. I, I love how he says, you know, bad writers um, are haunted by the notion that Latin or Greek words are grander than Saxon ones. Interesting that he uses a French word to do that. Okay. Um, but, um, and, you know, he, and he hates all of these words. Anglo-Saxon opposite numbers are the words that are, you know, you've probably heard of strunk and white. If you're American, the, without question, the most um, popular um, uh, style guide, uh, writing guide in, in the English language, in, in, in the United States, at least. By the way, it's an absolutely terrible book from any linguistic or grammatical point of view. Um, really, really bad, really, really bad. The, but the basic advice to write clearly, to write simply is fine. Um, the, great, the great linguist at Edinburgh who had been at Harvard, um, what does he call it? Um, He's got a he's he's got a an unrepeatable sentence about this book, but um, he says uh, they say avoid the elaborate pretentious the coy and the cute, um, and notice they use the Greek the, the Latin words for every one of those. Uh, oh, and I'm sorry, cute is German, is obviously English. Do not be tempted by twenty dollar word. Anglo Saxon is a livelier tongue than Latin, so use Anglo Saxon words. I mean, there's an idea of the power and immediacy of those short verbs, and th of course that's good stylistic advice. It's hard to generalize, but that's uh, you understand why they do it. A little asterisk, another asterisk here is that term Anglo-Saxon, which is used in a lot of these older um, uh, references, um, is no longer used by scholars uh, for the simple reason that in the past few decades, this term has been appropriated by racists um, who to, uh, to use it to identify groups of people, notably themselves. Um, and um, so scholars have simply determined to just simply stop using, even though this was standard vocabulary for, for a long time. So if you read something old and from the OED or something like that, they will refer to Anglo-Saxon, which was the language um, of that people. It is now referred to as Old English. Um, but now the, these uh, Old English terms refer to the intimate and the personal. I mean, think about this. The King James Bible translation, our father, which art in heaven. And what are the French words? Debts, temptation, and deliver. I mean, some, nothing could be more intimate. I take thee, I we can't quite see it, take to, 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 to my lawful wedded wife and to have and to hold to this day forward for better or worse. Every word is Old English until you get to cherish and part. Um, and so, again, the emotion is Old English, but the little kind of legal legalese uh, is, is French. But also all the nursery rhymes, of course, they're all Old English, right? They're all, you know, there might be a few words in the full poems that are from French or Latin, but certainly this bit, so the titles are all Old English. So the, in other words, there's something intimate and ancient about the Old English terms. And every single word in this song um, is, an, so they knew too, just like the poets. And look at other songs like Yesterday, um, the last stanza of Frank Sinatra's My Way. The entire love song called All of Me by Billie Holiday or, or Frank Sinatra, almost every single word in all of those are Anglo-Saxon words. And all, the other thing about my way is that they're all one syllable words. Um, and you realize how, I mean, it's kind of, and even Sinatra said, it's a terrible song, but, um, but it has an emotional punch. It does. Um, I, on the flight over, I saw the, the biography of uh, Claude Francois. Who, who composed the song, who composed that song. And, and, and it's a terrible, I mean, I, I basically don't think biopics are 
usually good movies. But um, there's a neat scene in this because Claude Francois was a French pop star. He was a heartthrob. He had written a ballad, it's kind of a heartbreak ballad uh, about his breakup with France Gall. Um, but it, but uh, it was given a new set of lyrics that became my way. Of course, the songs could not be more different in their text. I mean, it was just absolutely totally different. But they show this scene where um, in 1968, uh, a delivery comes with a, a fresh studio pressing of Sinatra's recording of that song and it's br and he brings it in, and he's like backstage at a, about to give a concert and he's a massive pop star i mean girls are fainting at his feet and he puts this on and it's just an incredibly emotional moment he knows his life has just changed because frank sinatra um just recorded the, and it was an obvious it was obviously going to be a hit um and it did change his life now there's something else to talk about because we haven't got to the food yet um there is something interesting about, again, class, when you talk about the animal when it's alive and the food that produces it. So cow is English, but beef is French. Pig is English, but pork is French. Sheep is English, mutton is French. So what you have here is a clear map of who was serving whom. Who monitored the, ang the animal in the farm, in the barnyard, and who was being served the food in the chateau. We have this embedded in our language that we speak every single day, and it shows a clear marking of class. One group was ruling another. This is a little sentence from that first dictionary I mentioned from 1604, and they knew he, he was completely aware of this in 1604. Therefore, either we must make a difference of English and say some is learned English and other some is rude English, or the one is court talk, the other is country speech, or else we must of necessity banish all affected rhetoric and use altogether one manner of language. So this is the very first dictionary, monolingual dictionary in the history of the English language. He was completely aware of this distinction. His dictionary was only for the one because everyone understood you learned the other at home. All right, uh, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to trot through language mechanics. I've been having too much fun. We're going there are, there are also mechanical linguistic uh, consequences to this because English has a lot uh, very few inflections, right, uh, for our verbs and our nouns, which makes English initially easy to learn in the first few steps. But this is why we have verbs and nouns that have the, 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 the syllabic stress on different syllables. So the nouns have the stress on the first syllable and the verbs on the second syllable. English had to figure out a way because French has no stress in, in its language. So it's record or record, right? Import or import, rebel or rebel, protest or protest. So you realize that English has, has created, you know, this is devilish for people learning English and especially French speakers who do not know where to put that stress. But also it's given us this nasty bit of confusable terms that are simply the identical word borrowed twice, and we've decided they mean different things. I mean, and the fact is, these are the kinds of things you see people make mistakes with on, on social media and uh, professionals and leaders and, uh, you know, everybody, I make these mistakes. I mean, th it's actually cruel that English has, has made um, discrete and discrete and principle and principle. And yet, and yet, if... This is the kind of thing that people have reported if they see on a, on a dating app profile, this is why they don't like someone. So just think about the arbitrary nature of judging someone according to the most arbitrary orthographic system in history. But we also have not just the words, but the grammar, French syntax. When we put the adjective after the noun, when the adjective is in the French position, every one of these imparts prestige to the profession. It's not an attorney, but the attorney general, the sergeant major. In, in both those cases, we, we, under, we as English speakers, might misunderstand because general is also a noun. Major is also a noun. But in these cases, they're adjectives. The attorney general is the most broadly uh, um, uh, remitted attorney, right? The poet laureate, the notary public, the heir apparent, the queen consort, the most looked up word at the Merriam-Webster dictionary last month. Knight errant court martial. I mean, there's a lot of these, but you recognize these are unusual. These are French. These are French. Why are they French? They are more prestigious. Um, we also have language myths. There are language myths that come from this problem with the, the, of connecting French to English. I mean, people who say you can't use literally figuratively, uh, people who say you can't use decimate to mean, except to mean killing one in 10 what, uh, uh, Roman soldiers, whatever that is, um, or that data is has to be a plural, or, or that continuous can only mean without stopping as opposed to continua. But what are you really saying? You're saying we want that word to be the Latin word, um, even though we're speaking English. We also have these weird, dumb, completely, you know, completely 
sort of inexplicable rules. Because the, the first grammars of English were written in the 18th century, those people's profession was grammarian. What were they grammarians of? They were grammarians of Latin. So they said you can't split an infinitive. Well, first of all, you can't, the English particle two um, doesn't exist in, in romance languages, right? So the difference between to go boldly and to boldly go is a distinction that can't be made in French. But I would, I would suggest to you that to boldly go confers some urgency to that particular construction. There is nothing grammatically wrong. It is completely native and natural to put a, ver a, a verb in that position. Terminal prepositions, adding a, a, a preposition at the end of the sentence, again, impossible in French, try it. Um, and this, you know, so this is the this is supposedly the um, the the semi rule that uh, inspired Winston Churchill to make the deathless comment. This is a bit of errant pedantry up with which I will not put. Um, again, we're almost done here. I before e. I mean, this is a this is a myth. This has nothing to do with English. It doesn't actually correspond whatsoever. Think, I mean, I before e. How many words in English have an e before an i? These are all native Old English words. So what does that rule actually mean? It means for words that came to English from French, it's more important to know how to spell them. That's all, it, it only works for the French words. It doesn't work for the native English words. We've even given a special rule for the French words in English. And we, if you want me to read it quickly, I know we're going, we're going late, but we do have the full rule in English on, uh, on, uh, on our website at Merriam-Webster. If you wanted to incorporate all of those exceptions. I before E except after C or when sounded as A as in neighbor and way unless the C is part of a sh sound as in glacier or it appears in comparatives and superlatives like fancier and also except when the vowels are sounded as E as in C's or I as in height also ing inflections ending in E as in queuing or in compound words as in albeit or occasionally in technical words with strong etymological links to the parent languages as in cuneiform or in other numerous and random exceptions such as science forfeit and weird. I believe, <laughs> not, I believe this was written by my uh, my former colleague Cor Corey Stamper, who wrote a great book called Word by Word about dictionaries. It's great. But now let's finally end on the concrete literal hierarchies. We've talked about uh, figurative hier hierarchies. The literal hierarchy is nothing more British than the aristocracy, right? But it's not the English aristocracy. It's the Norman aristocracy. Every one of those words is a French word. In fact, so French that that British did not like the sound of one of those words, it was so vulgar, they changed the word to the Old English word for one of the circle of the king. And that's why the wife of an earl is a countess. But what about these is another hierarchy that's extremely literal and every single word is French. So in other words, when we talk about hierarchies, not just the word hierarchy, but the hierarchies are literally in French and Latin. What about this? That's her initial. What is that letter? You know, it has nothing to do with anything that is English, right? That it's Elizabeth Regina or Charles Rex. And in fact, the 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 the, the seal of the Queen of England is covered in French. You have Dieu Montrois, which is the motto of the, the, the Queen. And then the, this is the order of the garter, which is Oni Swaki Manipense, which looks like Latin, but it's French. Right. And here's the this is because the recent um, passing, this is a commemorative mug from King Edward the, the Eighth. And you see Oniswaki Malipense around his head and Dieu Mondois. So literally, the king or queen of England um, is only expressed uh, in official terms in French. So just to review very quickly before I end, there were four real waves of French or Latin. We have the, the, the post-Roman wave, we have the, the Norman wave, the Parisian French that came after. And then the new Latin, the scientific vocabulary, and they all kind of as a as a, an amazing co cultural coincidence that the conquerors of this particular island that spoke this particular language spoke a language that was etymologically identical to the language of scholarship later. So in other words, the, the social hierarchy of the Middle Ages becomes the intellectual hierarchy of the modern times. Now, there's one last set of myths, which is the actual cultural myths of England, right? You have the um, story of King Arthur, which is the noble myth. The King Arthur myth, of course, was entirely written in French for French readers, right? It's La Morte d'Arthur, and it was translated into English. However, there is the yeoman's myth, the freemen, the men who were foresters and farmers. And the story of Robin Hood was not recorded in writing because it was entirely oral. It was a, a spoken tradition. It was spoken in English exclusively. 
And this is why I sort of call the talk according to these myths, because this is as deep as it gets in English mythology. And what did they do at this time with the language, but rob from the rich to give to the poor? So thank you very much. Thank you. Fantastic. So we have a little bit of time for some questions. Are there any questions in the audience? Ani swaki mari pons. I would render that as ill unto those who think thus. That's an extraordinary motto. It's a malediction. So it's an extraordinary attitude to have towards one's subjects. But also, you mentioned the Constitution and a lot of words are taken from it. And the one that is most problematic to me is bear, wait, to get um, a well-regulated militia uh, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms. Uh, this were there, it's subject to a lot of interpretation, interpretive difficulties, controversy. How would you define it? Um, I would since we don't have a lot of time, but nice to see you, David. <laughs> it's, uh, it's nice to see old friends here too. Um, there's a new book, I just blurbed the book um, uh, from Cambridge coming out on the language of our constitution and it, uh, by Professor Dennis Barron, uh, who goes by Dr. Grammar on Twitter, by the way, and he's a great linguist. It's a great book. And he addresses this in such depth that I, I won't, but there's one point that he makes that I think is worth repeating. We now have the ability to search electronically through thousands of texts that was never possible before. So now it's possible to assert that bearing arms in the 18th century always meant fighting. It, it, you don't bear arms against deer. Um, you, it, it doesn't mean hunting. It always meant the army. And so, and, and, and so the, the clear and natural, easy understanding of that term is at, today, as it was then, in fact, not really changed. Bearing arms means military. And so from a linguistic point of view, I think that's a, a subtle question. <laughs> right, right. But I mean, it's just an interesting thing. They're, they just simply, they don't overlap in this instance, in a linguistic sense. I mean, the other arguments we can't make. <laughs> More questions in person. Yes, hello. Here. Sure. How, um, apologies for being late. How do you use all this that you know in your job? <laughs> um you know i uh i just you, you you just absorb it i mean you this, this is the result of me thinking about this a lot and just noticing these things and i just thought if you put them together there might be a cumulative power to this narrative um i think there is i find it compelling myself um this is the very first time i've ever told this story um and um i i think i think it's one of those things that i i think the most satisfying things about my job are when things are hiding in plain sight. Um, and you suddenly realize I've been using this word and I never recognize that it means, you know, literally means this or has this history, you know. And so that's the little joys of working with words all the time. Um, and so what I tend to do is then group them together. And as you see, I, I've tried to group, make different groups and I, they weren't exactly sequential. It wasn't exactly uh, chronological because the groups don't, the groups actually speak to me in different ways, and they speak to all. But my point is, they speak to all of us in different ways, right? Um, and I do really believe in the emotional, the the, the um, amazing emotional power of the old English words in in, in the English language for me personally, um, the words of family. Um, but of course, the word family is one of these French words. Um, and so you recognize that we've created a, this interesting um, kind of bilingualism among uh, English speakers. And I'm not saying that one is a superior form of the language, but one is clearly a privileged form of the language. And that is what has become standard English, the professional language, the academic language, the ecclesiastical language, the one that is required for success, or whatever we call success. And that's just a fact. You know, that, that it, you have to, if you want to go to law school, you're going to learn those words. Uh, if you're going to go to medical school, you're going to go learn those words. And in other words, we've created a vocabulary that so in some measure is a measure. Oh, no, no, as a writer, that's different. And I and that's a big, important point, because the urgency and the tone and the, and the pace is nothing. And that's why, I mean, and also because we have that tonic stress, that wonderful, ha nothing to fear but fear itself. You can't do that in French. <laughs> um, okay. um, so 
I think many people would argue that's what makes English so incredibly satisfying and rich. Are there other languages that you've thought about that have a similar dichotomy that's as satisfying? Never. No. I mean, it, it, I mean, it, English is just a very unusual mutt uh, in that way, because the, 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 etym the etymological relationship for French is so straightforward. When Moliere makes fun of pedants, he puts Latin endings on French words so that everyone in the audience gets the joke. We, they all understand the words. They all understand that they're not supposed to really understand. You know, we don't know. Is that the you know, is that the plural? Is that the, um, so he makes fun of Latin um, as the highfalutin language. Um, and you know the professional language and the and the uh, family language they all because they share roots they don't have this clear dichotomy and there's other languages that like in like Hindi that you know that comes from Sanskrit which is their kind of you know older reference uh, uh, language and the Korean language which is was respelled Hangul which was respelled in the kind of the early modern period so that's why it's phonetically perfect because if if English if we could respell English if we did it for example in 1700 um, you know but what what that does is it wipes away those histories that I love having the silent bees and stuff I mean I often talk about etymology and just to simply say for example if you know nothing about me but were introduced to me you knew you would know where my grandfather was born, right? And that's what etymology is. You, that, I mean, you don't need to know anything about me, but oh, that name, okay, that's his etymology. Um, so I do like that. I, I think that, the, and the weirdness of spelling in English, the difficulty of spelling, of course, it's part of my job now. We'd, we'd be out of business. If we, um, but the fact is um, the weirdness of spelling actually contributes to the, this, this idea that knowledge is worth knowing, if that makes any sense to you. Um, and no, and I, what I mean is for a 14 year old at the National Spelling Bee to know that lepidoptery is a sub is a is a field of study that involves only one class of creature. Um, if you've never known that before now that opens your mind um, and, and you never forget it. Um, and I just think that that kind of classification, it's really about classification, you know, that's what, um, that kind of classification um, is a kind of knowledge that is separate from vocabulary. In other words, it's not a word you use every day, but now you know there's a word for that. I think that's I think that's kind of magical. Yes. Well, yeah. So we're from Chicago, and you may know that Chicago has the largest Polish population outside of Warsaw. So I think there are a lot of words in Chicago that are derived from Polish words. And I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I heard an article about this on the radio on our public radio station recently. So, you know, in Chicago, it's, you know, been a city for what, like 200 years. It's so amazing to be in France where everything is so old, but maybe it's just a matter of time in the United States for more languages to become adopted. Oh, absolutely. No, no question. And the, and the introduction of especially native words of other languages for foods is the richest source of borrowings of foreign terms in the English language for the last generation, without question, because now the world's becoming smaller and our palates are growing larger. So we in our in our dictionary, we are adding Korean terms and Hawaiian terms and, there are, and, and Turkish terms from these new cuisines. And that's really, really rich. Um, at the same time, of course, Polish is not uh, etymologically identical to the language of scholarship. You know, so that's, and so, yeah, but I mean that, that, so you've got, you know, these, these layers of aristocracy, bureaucracy, um, legal language, ecclesiastical language, university language. And then, you know, I mean, it just, it just, that depth is, is unmatchable and it won't be for, for any other language. I apologize in advance because of my accent, because <laughs> I'm an English student. Uh, I didn't catch the information about uh, the difference between Anglo-Saxon sex Saxon and uh, Old English. Oh, and that's right. There's a funny thing about uh, the way the French use that term also, right? Because they refer to me as an Anglo-Saxon, which is kind of strange. Um, you know, ethnically has, is, is ridiculous, but they do. They do. Um, no, it's simply because the term, it was the scholarly term for the language that was spoken before Norman conquest. However, that term Anglo-Saxon has been appropriated by modern racists to identify themselves. Um, and because of that, scholars of language want to separate from the racists and they refer to the language as simply Old English rather than Anglo-Saxon. So old texts will use Anglo-Saxon, old dictionaries will use Anglo-Saxon. It means the same thing. We've just, I say we, linguistics scholars have decided to stop using that term 
to just simply put it to sleep. And it's a, it's a kind of an interesting, it's an interesting phenomenon. Yeah. We, oh. I'm sorry, we have one. We, so we have time for one more question here and then you're welcome to go up to Peter. He'll be here. You can ask questions afterwards more informally. Thank you so much for this talk. It was really fascinating. Um, I was just curious, uh, you know, in living in France, we have a pretty protectionist mindset of the language here. English obviously has absorbed a lot over time. Do you get the sense that it's because of that history of kind of morphing and becoming many languages that it allows for that? Or is there another I question? think that's a huge and important question. And it, it, there is something I would call it almost an, an aesthetic of expansion that English has, that French has the opposite, has an aesthetic of reduction. And the thing is, think about think about what uh, in the what were they call the neoclassical, the Racine and Corneille and Molière, they were literally trying to write uh, with as few different words as possible to emulate the the Virgils and the you know the classics, whereas you had Shakespeare who was exploding the vocabulary. So even during that early modern period, um, and what was called the quarrel of the ancients and the modern, some of you might know, um, you the, the 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 dispute between the perfection of the ancients, which was an ideal, and the um, practice of the moderns, which was the real. Um, was a, a real tension. The fact is, in English, it was never really a question, which is why there's no acad a a Academy of English, right? <laughs> you know. <laughs>